Good morning. morning. Glad you're here this morning on, I guess it's either Redwood winter or it's uh, going to be Dogwood winter. I'm not really sure, but it's one of the winters and it has returned. So I hope you didn't plant any plants yesterday on this beautiful weather because remember, it's not safe in Tennessee to plant until tax day. Don't plant any plants until tax day. That's when our latest frost is. So if you plant any plants, I'm sorry, go cover them up. You're going to need to do that because it's going to be 29 degrees tonight and so... Uh, uh, remember that. That's a healthy tip, isn't it, for the morning? Get you started, Joy. I'm Jeremy Squires, lead pastor here at Good Shepherd. So glad you're here this morning. We've soaked in pre-worship music. Remember, that's our pre-worship music. So you, you are running like you're late. The whole point of it is to get you in here so you're not late. So uh, when I get up here and talk, that's when you're late. And uh, so if you're here before that, you're good to go. Uh, we have a few announcements to make this morning as we gather in this place. We welcome all those of you watching us online. Hopefully we're not blurry this week. We left the camera on all last week and the uh, week before, and that's why it was blurry for the first part of the service last week. But uh, that's our new soft focus approach to worship, so hope you enjoyed that. Uh, first of all, your insert has all the things that are going on for Easter and for Holy Week. You'll see the whole schedule of the events, how you can help. It's going to be here before you know it. Please help us by uh, buying a Easter lily in memory or in honor of someone. You can see more information about that. Easter egg hunt still needs candy, and there are, bath there are still bags of eggs outside. So if you haven't gotten one or you want to get another or take two, they're right outside the door. And uh, please take some eggs and get those filled. Steph needs them back next Sunday. Next. Everybody say that next Sunday. So when you get your eggs, you're going to bring them back by next Sunday. All right. Very good. So please pick some of those up and follow the directions on the bags, and you're good to go. And then on the back side of your bulletin, a few things are happening. Next week is Men's Barbecue and Bible, and also it's complicated. We've already mentioned the Easter egg hunt. Don't forget to sign up for the Seder meal. Uh, that is up on Realm now. Came active last night. You should have gotten an email about it. You can go and be able to go to your Realm account and do that and click on that and be able to do that. If you don't have your Realm account set up, shame on you. I've asked you like 5,000 times. I know who you are, just so you know. There's a whole list of them that pop up every day in my life that tell me you haven't signed up for your Realm account yet. If you got any problems, I'd be glad to help you get signed up. If you're just not going to do it, there's a pad of paper out there where you can sign up for the, for the Seder meal outside the door. But please, please, please help us out by signing up for your Realm account. We can set it up for you and do it really easy for you. And then uh, Wednesday night dinner didn't make it into the bulletin correctly, uh, but it is in the connection correctly, which it is. Hamburger steak, mac and cheese, roasted veggies, and salad and dessert. I changed all that, but somehow it didn't get into the final thing. So 
that's what the, that's what it is in here as well as your prayer list and as well as a few other things to look at like helping to make palm crosses so check it out all those things are going on and today there's a big event going on right james yeah we're going to have a what So for Literacy Month, you've been collecting books. A mobile book fair is going out using our new minibus, and they're going to go out there and set up in the Westington, who has new management, actually, and is very interested in working with us in many different ways. And uh, so if you'd like to be part of that, you're going to meet what time? 12.30. There you go, 12.30. Yeah, 12.30. 12.30. Yeah, 12.30, they've got to meet to get over there. Thanks, Shelly. Okay. Show you my comedy relief. See, we, we do this well. So 12.30, meet here, go over there, and, and have this great experience of all these books. Thanks so much for all the books that you gave us. That is awesome. How about some joys this morning? Some, got some celebrations this morning as we gather together? Some birthdays? You know, at all? I am so sorry, Louise. I didn't know that you sold your birthday. I mean, that's in the Bible. It's called a birthright, but I didn't know you sold your birthday. Please don't do that. Oh, I got it. So you're 30, 39 forever, 29 forever, 19 forever, whatever it might be. How about some birthdays first? Birthdays. Anniversaries. Got any anniversaries? All right. Louise, what do you got to share? Yeah, new business starting tomorrow morning. She already has, how many clients do you already have? 11 clients already. She's ready to go out and tutor the world. So we're excited about that. And we're praying for you. And she's got a whole, like a place. Like you need to go by and visit it and just see her place. And you need to give us the address so we can do that. And uh, so we'll be able to share that and go see her wonderful place that she's done. Do you have a birthday? Happy birthday! Right, good birthday yesterday. Awesome, very good. Give me something else to celebrate this morning as we gather in this place. What do we got? What's happening? Betty Barra. Okay. Great. Friends from Maryland here in Tennessee with us. That's awesome, good. We also celebrated uh, last, uh, last week, it seems like it was like forever now, but we celebrated Tom Sarton's 80th birthday. Al tricked him into coming and going to get some food for a family, and then we pulled the, the door down, and we, uh, he had family here from Rhode Island oh, wow. that came just for that, the guy on the left. And so it was a great opportunity. Thanks for everybody that helped out with that and the whole team of people who made food and everything else for that. But he was completely surprised. I thought he was going to die. And I thought, this is the worst party I've ever been to in my life. I'm not going to one of these again. He looked like he was going to pass out. He really did. I'm like going, please don't have a heart attack right now. This would be a horrible party. And uh, he did not. And we had lots of people here. And they were all, we, had to all, we were all hiding in the corner so they couldn't see through the glass door of the fellowship hall. So there are 85 people or so in that corner all shoved together just waiting for him to, to come in. So it was, a good, it was a good time. So we celebrate that with Tom and all that he does for the church. Stand up. Get up. Make somebody welcome this morning. Shake off the chill. No shaking or faking.
gain something and that your words reach our hearts this morning, God. We just thank you for being here with us this morning. We're so thankful for you and we love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. How deep the Father's love is for us. That God would carry the weight of our sins upon the cross and to give us a new life. So what kind of gifts can we offer? There's obviously no gift that we can offer that can ever meet that same level of sacrifice to us. But God does call us to sacrifice. God calls us to sacrifice in our, in our time of prayer. To actually carve out time to, to be in prayer for our own lives, for the lives of others, to intercede on others' behalves like we find in our prayer list. And I hope every week you take that home and look at those names. They're real people who are going through hard times. In the same way that you would want your name on that list, you would want people to pray for you. Then pray for those who've asked for prayers from us. That is a part of what it means to be a member of this community, to be in prayer. We think about Lester who has shoulder surgery this past week, and so we need to remember him in our, in our prayers. Ray Hamilton, who had successful surgery but has been up and down ever since, and we don't know what the outcome is going to be. He and Carolyn need our prayers and our contact. If we're going to be community, it means more than sitting together on Sunday morning. It means taking time to reach out at other times in our life. That's what it means about coming together and being in this place. It means that when we're present, not only here, we're present also in small groups gathering together. We're, we're figuring it out. There were two folks on Saturday morning during the time of, we were, of the work day who were gathering together in their small group because it wasn't their time to get together, but they weren't going to let their small group time go by. Because the real meat of what we do the real depth of how we get into where it is that we need to go, it comes from small groups. It doesn't come from Sunday morning. If you remember the sermon by Tuesday, I would be lucky. But the small group time that you have together, you will remember much longer. Being involved in people's lives together like that. But when we're in present in this place and we come together, it's amazing that, you know, at the start of worship, there are about 25 of us or 30 of us, and by the time that I look up, there are 100, 100 of us or so. When we gather together, it makes a big difference. And so we take a time in this church to be able to take that blue pad and write down our names and say, I'm here to worship God today. I'm here to gather together people who all over the place, different places of different lives and, and different beliefs and, and coming together in, in these moments, we're going to center ourselves and focus ourselves on God. Please take the blue pad, please take it out and, and fill it out and pass it down your row and let others sign it as well. If you're a guest with us here today, we're so glad you've chosen to worship with us and that you have come here to find a place to belong. All of us want a place to belong. Some of us have found that last year, the year before, or many years ago, and, and that's why you're here. You're here together to belong and then to believe and to become whatever it is that God has created you to be. That's important. God has something for us greater than we are now. We find that together in the presence of each other and in the presence of the Holy Spirit. So please pass that pad down your row and, and fill it out. Financially, to be able to give. Now you may wonder why this little chair is right here. This little chair is the future of the chairs in the CLC. The metal chairs are ending their life quickly. Trustees have gotten together and looked at several examples of said chair. This chair is strong. This chair is not going anywhere. And it's about 20 pounds lighter than the chairs we have now. Now, we can buy all these chairs. It's even got, see, it's got a locking brace in the bottom of it. We can buy these chairs from the church itself, or we can save the church some money by all chipping in $10 or $20 or more to buy a chair. 
No, we're not going to put a plaque of your name on the back of the chair or anything like that. We're not going to do that. But you can have the gracious understanding of knowing that you bought a chair for the future of your church so we can replace the metal chairs and begin to take these and do a lot more with them. These are really easy. I mean, we can do all kinds of things. So if you would do that, then you can do that on, on our uh, Realm Giving, obviously, put in the memo, chair, something along those lines, pretty simple. So we can be able to collect money for that. In $10 a chair, buy as many as you'd like, and we'll buy as many chairs as we have money for, and we'll replace the chairs that are in there. So, or you can write a check and write chairs on it, or you can put cash in an envelope and write chair on it. As long as it says chair somewhere, we're good to go. But that's what we do together. If we all buy a chair, then we'll have plenty of chairs. If, if we did it by ourselves, obviously I can't buy, you know, that many chairs, but together we can do that. And then to serve. Yesterday was a lot of serving. You'll see some pictures of that during the sermon. Um, if you haven't walked around this whole campus, driven around it, take a, take a drive around to tomorrow, today and see all the work that was done. Walk around inside. Look at all the windows. Look at the ceiling. Look at all the places that we've been working on over the last couple of days to get ready for Easter for our guests. We prepare our hearts, also prepare our place for hospitality. And then it's for witness. How are we going to show our witness? How have you been showing your witness? Where is it at? How have you been an ambassador for Christ everywhere you've gone? Like if somebody knew when you walked into a place that you're the ambassador for Christ, that you're the one who's to bring the message, to bring the good word, to bring the good news to someone, to bring kindness. Have you been doing that? That's our witness. So all these things we gather together this morning and offer them from our heads and from our hearts and from our hands. Let our ushers come forward to receive this morning. This song we're going to do is new to the church, so um, you can sing along if you catch on or if you just like to do it. That's totally fine. If you want to stand at any point, you're welcome to, but we are not expecting slash requiring you to. Just enjoy the song and just soak up the word. Thank you. 
Let's all stand as we give to God this. Gracious God, we hear this. What have we deserve to receive a love like this? I don't know. It's nothing. That's why it's grace. It's grace that comes and bathes us and cleanses us and gives us a new life. It's grace that was unearned and undeserved and unmerited and every other un you can think of. It's grace that allows us to connect and, and to come into this place of worship and to feel your presence and the power of your Holy Spirit. It's grace that allows us to be able to continue to grow and to fail and sometimes fail miserably and what it means to be a follower of you. But it's that grace that allows us to start again and to keep moving on to that journey of sanctification, be made holy, be more like you. It's that same grace that begins to pour out of us because we receive so much that just says we have to go out and serve that we have to go out into the world and, and to connect with our neighbors and our community, like the book fair today, to, to do something different, to try new things and to reach people and to show that we care, people that we don't know, people who are our neighbors just the same. And to really go out into the world to more than just ways of serving, but just ways of being, to show loving kindness to those around us, to show folks that the, not the only image of Christians is those who are judgmental or those who condemn, but there are Christians who love. There are Christians who are ready to say that you matter, that everybody matters, that we are all loved by God, even those who don't know it yet. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would use our prayers and let our prayers be fruitful, let our prayers be faithful, and that you would take our presence here and, and allow that to be a part of gathering together as community and coming together. And that you would take all of our financial resources, the things that you've given to us, and you would take those and use those and allow them to be given freely to not only things inside of this church, but things outside of this church, and people we haven't even met yet. That you would allow us to serve faithfully. You allow us to witness. So God, we gather all these things together and we give them to you because we know you make them holy and we know that you can use them for your mission in the world. So God, use them and use us to change your world one life at a time. In Jesus Christ's name we offer them and the people of God said together, Amen. You may be seated. Invite our kids to head to the back for kids' worship this morning. Head on back. There's a whole train. And let's go to the Lord in prayer and center ourselves to receive God's word this morning. Lord, center us and center our hearts. Speak to us about what it means to, to come together and to return to your heart. Empower us to know what it means to be your ambassadors, to know that we are a new creation. Lord, pour that new creation into us this morning. Do a new thing in us. Change us. Melt us and mold us and make us into what you would have us to be. In Jesus Christ's name, we ask, and we hope, and we plead. Infuse us. Invest in us. Love us. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray. The people of God said together, Amen. I did want to add one more prayer request that you may not know about, but uh, Callie Gaffney, Suzanne Gaffney's daughter, has Lyme's disease. And she's very sick. And she needs our prayers.
And uh, so please remember her and that family as they embark on this journey. I also invite you to follow along with the YouVersion Bible app and see all the notes and everything that's going on. Make sure you save the event before you leave or it'll disappear after services are over today. So hopefully it might be a good tool to help you to get more into your Bible. The YouVersion app is a great way to be able to do daily Bible readings, to look at a Bible plan, to do all kinds of things. And so I hope that you're using your phone for more than texting, Facebooking, or social media people when really it could be used in a lot of other ways to do some good things that are uplifting and, and empowering as well. So we have embarked on a journey to return to the heart of God. That's what we're doing through all of these weeks. And as we walk these 20 days of Lent that are, le are left towards resurrection, we're embracing transformation, new possibilities, new life. That's what the journey is all about to Easter. It's not just t chicks and ducks and bunnies and candy and Easter egg hunts and fine clothes. It's so much deeper than that. But we still have some work to do before we arrive in the garden with an empty tomb that we're so excited about. And as Easter begins to appear on the very distant horizon, we might be tempted to walk the Via Della Rosa, the way of sorrow and suffering, faster. Just trying to get to Easter. But if we listen to the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5... Well, we're reminded that we still need to walk slowly and with great care. Before we can get to the new creation of Easter, we have some repair work to do within our own hearts, within our world, even in our own church. That's what we did yesterday. We did some work outside. It began with a lot of of destruction that I wasn't sure about. Go back a slide, Mark, so we'll be on track. It's my fault, not yours. Go back. Like I asked the question after they came through the, earlier this week, where are my bushes? There they are. They're all gone. Outside my office back door, I have a back door to my office. It's the only window I have in my office. I open it up and have a screen door on it so I can actually get some kind of fresh air and pretend like I actually don't live in a cave. The bushes are all gone. And the task loomed large before us, literally, with hundreds of bags of mulch. How many bags it even was? How many bags was it? Do you remember? 90, see? See? Mm, that's good. Thank you. Not enough. Well, some of it got washed out just last night, too. But we came together on the outside and the inside doing work. They did the outside of the windows and the inside of the windows. I don't have time to show all those pictures. They're all on Facebook. You can see them all. Every window has been cleaned all the way around the building on the inside and the outside until the rain hit it last night. And with power beyond our own strength to remove some things that were dead... There's no way we would have pulled these bushes without Mark's tractor taking that thing out and ripping it apart. We began the work of repairing. Repairing things and putting them back together and finding new ways to create different things so that transformation could happen. That's what it looks like now. And all that junk that was back there, I said when the bushes got cut down, if there's any junk and it can be seen, it's out. So the pond's gone, everything else that was back there is gone. That's what it takes for transformation to happen to get rid of the old stuff. To clean out some of the things that you just don't need anymore and you've kept around because you kind of think, well, someday we're going to use it or whatever else. And in your own heart, it's the same way. I'll keep this stuff around because I need it. But you don't. 
In order to put new things in, you have to clear out the old. So places that were in disrepair. You look at the, you know, anybody who has to have clean lines can see what's wrong with this picture immediately. What is wrong with this picture immediately? That brick is in the wrong place. And somebody needs to fix that. And anybody could have who walked through those doors and nobody ever stopped to fix it. Caddy Wampus. And those places were brought back to new life, working together. Over 30 people or so, I lost count after a while, people came when people went, that sort of thing. And the beauty of new creation was all around us in the repair work. You need to go out and just look at it. And now you can see the flowers much more, and you can, you can see each part of it because it's all repaired, fixed together. And then sometimes we see to stop and to remember why we came together as this crazy quilt of people called Good Shepherd in the first place. Have you ever, ever stopped to just stand outside and look at the cornerstone of our building? You need to stop at it and look at it and remember who we are. I mean, it says that we as a Christian, we are a Christian family committed to caring, loving, and supporting each other. What? Can you read it? What does it say? Together. Together. Caring, loving, and supporting each other together. Following the word of God, we are taking a bold step into the future with God. 1996, when this building was completed and built. They had no idea what would happen decades and decades later. And they put that stone in of the first building of two. Not just one building. There's also a cornerstone on the other building as well. They never could have envisioned that when they started out with this. You see, so far in our journey, we have traveled through fruitful fields, barren wilderness, countless stars, promises of God that are both large and small, and tables where all are fed. And now, like threads that sew together a patchwork quilt, this week we are beginning binding together our journey with repentance and reconciliation and repair. I mean, what are you audaciously, audaciously hoping for during this journey of the empty tomb? What are you hoping for? What do you want things to be different? Or just the same? But what do you want not only for yourself, but for others? For your community? What would you like to see to be different, to be changed in the community? How do you want to be different? There's a particular concept that our Jewish brothers and sisters use to describe how they are called to respond to a world that feels like it's coming apart at the seams. It's called Tikkun Alam. Tikkun Alam, in the simplest terms, means to repair the world. To repair the world. When the fabric of society is torn, to con along not only calls each of us to participate in mending what is broken, but to make it better than it was before it was damaged. Amen? And when it comes to the art of repairing the world, there are no shortcuts. There are no easy answers. It is the difficult and time-consuming work of repairing by way of reconciliation and restoration. And those are not easy. And they don't just happen overnight. To repair systems and structures, we usually need to break them down to their basic levels. That's what I do when I look at something and break it down, look at it and go, what, why does this not work? What has to change? 
We have to see where the problem is. Address the root cause of the failure. And then begin rebuilding from that point. Outside, we had to start fresh in some places where it's just like, you know, when Mark and I were pulling down that, that uh, laurel over there, Mark said, well, it's still got some life left in it. I said, it's got two branches that are still alive. We've got to get it out. That's hard. Sometimes you've got to start fresh, even when there appears to be a little life left in something in order to be able to repair the world and to change it. It's not hard to look around this world and our denomination as United Methodists and our own communities, perhaps even our own families, and see a thousand different fissures, cracks, brokenness that exists. Cracks where God's harmonious creation has somehow gone awry. That the plan that God has placed within our hearts and within our communities is not going the way that it's supposed to go. And the cracks show. Takan Alam is not about grand gestures, but rather small acts of kindness. Small acts of kindness. Small steps made in faith. Some displays of love and solidarity. My good friend Kim believes in random acts of kindness. I don't believe any act of kindness is random or should be. They're all deliberate and planned and intentional. They're not random. They're intentionally random. That's how it starts. People are changed. Societies are changed. Systems are changed by showing kindness. Paul says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we no longer know him that way. You see, each daily action that embodies loving kindness does not necessarily make an immediate large impact. You may think the acts that you do every day of loving kindness just don't really matter. They don't make any difference. It doesn't change the world, and yet it does. Because as we keep loving and walking in grace, our collective actions all together, they add up. A little bit of yeast can change all the dough around it. A mustard seed can grow from the smallest of seeds into the largest of trees. The weeds that we pulled were tough and hard and grow much faster sometimes than the plants around them. They can be invasive, these acts of kindness. They can begin to make a new world, a whole new creation. If only we have eyes to see it. Not the eyes of doubt or the eyes of cynicism or the eyes of a realist or the eyes that say it cannot be done. What would it mean for you to begin seeing with eyes of faith? The same eyes of faith that the people who gathered together to start this church had, not knowing what the future might bring, even back in 1991 when they still left their home in Rivergate. They'd been for years and years and years and said, you know what, we're going to leave the place that we love. Can you imagine leaving this place to go on to the next thing? But Debbie, someday you might have to do that. Someday this building will be sold the same way. You might have to go to some other place that's 20,000 acres to be able to reach people of Hendersonville. Those are the tough decisions. In order to create something new, Something old sometimes has to change to be repaired or taken down. That's what Paul was suggesting to the Corinthians. See, what, he, what he's talking about here, he says, he urged the gathered community in Corinth to expand their vision, to expand their vision of who they were and, and what they are and how they could be something more. He says, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new what? Creation. There's a new creation, not the old one. It's not reformed. It slapped some paint on it. It's a new creation. It's something new. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Did he say some things that are old have passed away? 
Did he say a few things that are old have passed away? He said everything that is old has passed away. And this kind of seeing moves beyond what our eyes can visibly see. Because most of us can't see anything that we already know, what we already have, what we already feel comfortable with. Louise is going on a brand new spanking journey that she has no idea where it's going to go. And she's investing her life in, and her time, and her energy, and her money. That's bold. Most of us would just stay in the same place. However, she was forced to move out of that place by circumstances beyond her control. And a lot of times that happens for us. We're only forced to move out of the old when we have to. See, humanity has always tended to focus on what is broken, what is limiting, what is imperfect, both in ourselves and in the world. We can't focus on the things out there that we can see that can be done differently. We can only focus on the things that we know. And usually they're imperfect and they're broken and they don't work. So we'll, replay, we'll work on that piece of whatever it is 15 times and keep repairing it when we know that it's time to get rid of it, when we know it doesn't work anymore because we don't want something new. We like the old. And so we keep doing that. What if on our way to building a new and better world, all the limits we put on people and things were suddenly blown apart? What if in this new creation we actually believe that everybody was new, that everybody had the freedom and to be able to be who it is they're called to be, and everything could change and be different? What if we started to see the world through the eyes of Christ? Now, you may not know what this is. Some of you do know what this is. Debbie, don't start crying. Come on, Debbie, keep it together. If I knew the background story of it, see, and there you go. I don't know that. So, if you ever been up the children's wing, if you haven't, shame on you. Go see the children's wing once in your life. If you don't have kids, good Lord, please see the rest of the church besides here in your Sunday school classroom or something else. Look at the rest of the church. It's magnificent. If you were to go upstairs along that wall, there is just basically a desert painted on it. It's an oasis. It's got some water. That's correct. Thank you so much for that correction. It's an oasis to go with the water's edge, long forgotten by most of us who are here, because not everybody has been here for a decade. But there's something in the oasis that no one bothered ever tell me about in the six years that I've been here. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? In the oasis, do you see it? With your eyes, do you see it if you don't know it? Do you see what I'm talking about in this part of the oasis? What do you see if you don't know it already? If you don't know what it is, if you already know about it, keep your lips sealed. It's a face. Never knew that, right? And it's the face of who, do you think? Always the good Sunday school answer. It's the face of Jesus that the artist put in the oasis upstairs. Okay. He does in every mural that he paints. Really? Huh. Oh, Tim's brother? Oh. But in order to see that, it takes what? A different set of eyes, doesn't it? It's not just visible to everybody when they walk down the hallway that the face of Jesus stands out. Now we're going to go upstairs, hopefully, and go find it and figure it out. I'm not telling you where it is in the mural. It takes a different set of eyes to see Jesus than the ones that we usually use. I mean, what if we started to see the world through the eyes of Christ whose eyes saw human difference as an opportunity to expand the reign of God on earth? I mean, look at his disciples. Look at how different they were. Jesus thought through all the barriers, all the boundaries, all the things that we are to be able to see who we might become, not who was there in front of him. 
Because the disciples on the surface looked pretty rough. They weren't exactly the kind of people you would choose to be followers and leaders later on. And Jesus broke these barriers and boundaries to the point where even death lost its finality. Death had no meaning. The death of someone else, himself, there was nothing. Those boundaries were gone. To his friend Lazarus, to his family weeping and crying, he said he is only sleeping. Jesus saw through all the brokenness and the hopelessness, and he poured himself out to the point where love conquered all. We have to believe that, that love conquered all, even in the midst of our world where we think it doesn't, that it still does, that it's not some fantasy, that it's true, that love does conquer all. And all that we do and all that we say, all that we are. What, what if part of our Lenten discipline involves learning to see with grace-healed eyes? To see the best in other people. To see the grace in them, not the least. And the brokenness. But if we had grace-healed eyes, what if we learned how to see with a newer, broader vision, the widening of our vision also widened our hearts? To be able to see broadly with God's eyes. What if we focus on the threads of creation that bind us together and not the things that tear us apart? And through the work of reconciliation began to stitch the threads of a new creation. Threads that would bind us closer to one another and to God, even though that each part is so different. We went and saw the Presleys on Friday night and able to see Sean squared. And one of the things that we're talking about was, as they were showing us, was is that they have all these quilts. Well, they have a lot of quilts on the Debbie, a lot of quilts. Some of those quilts are from members of the family, grandmothers, great, great, you know, people in the family. One of those quilts is, is, was given to him by uh, Jackie and Zan. It was Gladys Blackburn's quilt that they have and the closest in that relationship that they have. But all these different quilts. And so it was interesting to see all those quilts be together. We only have three quilts in our house. made by the, by, by the secret quilt maker here, who's not so secret, but good enough. These are the quilts that we have made by different people. This is one from our family, from Susan's family of quilt makers. Stripes to squares, made for Hannah Squire by Margaret Scott. which is Susan's father's sister. This is a quilt from Susan's side of the family as well. Everything's different, right? They all look the same. I mean, it's not the same star all the way through it, is it? That'd be a pretty boring looking quilt, wouldn't it? And then you have this quilt. Everything on this quilt means something to the quilt maker that also means something to us. But look how different it is. There is nothing on this quilt that's the same. This is the crazy quilt of our lives. This is the crazy quilt of our church that we're all different, stitched together to form one community of faith. No matter how different we might be from the smiley face that sticks out of it to, to love, 
to Jesus, to musical notes, to watermelons. That's how quilts are. They're all different, and their uniqueness makes them what they are. What if we allowed what we had in common to bring us closer than those things we differ in? To be stitched together even in our different sizes and uniqueness and ways to be stitched together to form something that comes together and bonds us. Our reading from Paul recalls a prophecy from Isaiah 43 about the world made new that says, Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And Paul continues Isaiah's theme, telling us the new creation is always and everywhere in our midst. It's always being created. It is created by us through Christ. We are God's visions. We are the ones that are resurrected in Christ. We are the ones who, while walking the wilderness way, have found the living water in the desert Isaiah tells us about. It's no longer enough to simply see and perceive that a new world is possible because we are to be agents of reconciliation. Amen? We are to be the ones to change the world and to make the difference, to reconcile people together and to work together for reconciliation of communities and of neighbors and of family. We are to be the ones to do that. We are the reconciliation Paul proclaimed, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Anyone, anyone. Are you in Christ? Then you're a new creation, he says. And the Lenten wilderness is a place where it becomes necessary to shed some of our old ways. To let go of some of the things that hold us back. We need to let go of our sin and our selfishness, of our greed in our self-centeredness, to make room for this whole new resurrected life that we're being called to live. Paul continues, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Is it any more clear than that? That we are given the ministry of reconciliation. That that's our job. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. Paul asked the community and us to be reconciled, trusting the ministry of reconciliation to us. Reconciliation will involve letting go of our old ways of seeing and how can our Lenten journey help us to see beyond the obstacles and the stumbling blocks and the places where the fabric of humanity seems too threadbare, too torn? And how can we begin to open the eyes of our hearts, dream of a world fully reconciled and renewed and resurrected and restored? That's the goal. For a world to be reconciled to God, that's what it looks like. See, some of us resist a new vision because we hang on to the old one. We resist a new way of living and being. We are content to stay in our own grave clothes, like that comfortable sweatshirt and those sweatpants you've been wearing for the last 30 years and have never given up. But hope to God you don't go outside and wear them out in public. And but our grave clothes are really comfortable. And it's easy to stay in them instead of wearing resurrection clothes and being clothed in the resurrection. But the good news is Christ keeps calling, keeps beckoning, keeps pulling at us, drawing us together so all creation might be reconciled to God. The good news is that when we see the frayed edges of human injustice, and indignity with the eyes of Christ that we are compelled to start the work of repair and the work of mending, amen? That we want to repair. We just want to walk by the outside and go, yeah, it looks like junk outside. We'll just leave it like that. Yeah, we won't do any of that stuff. Let's not trim that over there. That's too much work. 
Let's not dig all that stuff over here. That's, yeah. Let's not clean the place. Let's just let it be dirty every time we walk in. That's somebody else's job to do. No, we take it on to be ours. The repairing of the world is up to us. In my denomination, I have chosen to be an activist and not just a connector. I am working hard with my clergy friends across all boundaries because I will not be silent any longer. I'm a centrist. I've created a group. I'm working on gathering my clergy colleagues before annual conference to talk so we don't have a repeat of general conference at our, our annual conference. And I will not be silent. We need to be able to reconcile together in our relationships, even when we don't believe the same things, even if it means that we're not together. That doesn't change the work of reconciliation. John Wesley, in his sermon, talks about some different things He talks about new birth and reconciliation. The salvation is a gift of God that has personal and community dimensions that God continues to change us into the image of Christ. It's like a new birth experience. Jesus told Nicodemus that he must be born from above. He must be born again in John 3. Because not only does our relationship with God change, but so does our relationship with the world. It changes to be born again. And he writes in his sermon, The New Birth, he says, God works this momentous change of new birth in the soul, bringing it into life and raising it from the death of sin to the life of righteousness. It is the change worked in the soul by the Almighty Spirit of God who creates us anew in Christ Jesus according to the image of the Creator. And then he continues, The new birth is being born anew in true righteousness and holiness when love for the world is changed into the love for God. Pride is changed into humility, anger into meekness, and hatred, envy, and hostility into a sincere, tender, unbiased love for all humankind. In a word, the new birth is the change by which the earthly, unspiritual, devilish mind is turned into the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. This is the nature of the new birth. And so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And then Paul begins to close with these words. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, We entreat you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. The world will never glimpse God's vision unless we share it. Unless we make a concerted effort to say with our hearts and lives, this is where the world has been torn asunder. This is where love is calling us to go. This is what love is calling us to bind and to build. And to ask the question, what might it look like for us to be an ambassador for Christ today? What does that look like to really live out our faith more than coming to church or reading our Bible or praying or anything else? What does it really mean in the outside world and every place that you go to be an ambassador for Christ? At your job, at your soccer team, at your school, in your home, What does it mean to be an ambassador for Christ? For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So let us heal the hurt with the ties that bind it together back in Christ. Let us point to the places where water flows in the desert of life, Let us work to live into the fullness of God's creation and let us see beauty while creating harmony and justice and reconciliation one small act at a time. Let us come together with all our hearts and return to God and knit this world into this crazy quilt of reconciliation 
and love and forgiveness. Amen. One bread, one body. One Lord and Savior of all. It could have stayed just that way. But it doesn't. He who became sin, who knew no sin, who gave his life for us, was broken for us. No longer whole, but broken to make us whole. He gathered his disciples in community and, and they shared together in this last supper and they were friends. He called them friends. And he grieved, and it was hard for him to leave his friends. It was hard for him to break the circle that they had been about for the last three years and to know that what he was about to do would mean he's no longer part of their earthly circle. And he knew it would hurt them. And yet he still raised the cup and said to them, this is my blood. I'm pouring it out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And when you drink it, I want you to remember. Remember the sacrifice. Remember my love for you. And the forgiveness that I've brought to you. And so this table reminds us every time that we partake of it, the whole idea that God has gathered together and reconciled us. Humanity to God. And also calls us to reconcile to each other as well. It's a vertical and a horizontal relationship that changes who we are and changes the world. And it all comes from God. So as we come forward this morning, I hope you'll think about what it means to be an ambassador for Christ, to live out this ministry of reconciliation that was given to us. Who in your life needs reconciliation from you or be able to give it to you? Who in your community needs to be reconciled in the church and in the greater community of your life in every circle that you're in? Where does reconciliation need to happen in restoration and repair? Let us pray as those come forward to serve. Gracious God, may this bread and this juice be for us the reminders of your great love. We remember we are called to reconcile. We are called to repair and restore relationships. So Lord, just pour into these things now as we receive them with your hope and your truth. Pour your Holy Spirit in them now as we receive. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. People of God said together, Amen. and forgiveness, grace beyond all measure, love of God, and extend to those around you as you receive it.
simple gospel. It's a simple choice about coming together in reconciliation and forgiveness and love and new creation. You have been created new. Live like you're new, not like you're part of the old. Let it wash over you and change you. Let you be an ambassador for Christ. Go forward knowing you've been given that title today to leave this place and to be an ambassador to every person you meet.